So GDC was a big thing that happened the other week, and across all the big news media outlets, there's a lot of optimism about what went down. There's a lot of talk about the game industry waking up and embracing better ideas and putting bad habits behind. And I should know about that stuff, right? I was there. But in a lot of ways, I kind of sort of feel like I wasn't. That's probably because I couldn't attend the conference part of the Game Developers Conference. Though the trip was still worth the price of the $200 Expo Pass, it locked me out of a lot of newsworthy events. But since I still had access to a show floor with the week's worth of material, I got a good impression of what developers are up to these days, and I even came away from it with a good deal of optimism of my own. The problem is that GDC is hardly a bastion of economic accessibility, and we pretty much have to rely on fancier reporters than myself to get into all these talks. But if my stuff wasn't optimistic for you, don't worry, because we have Lay Alexander to help. Lay Alexander is the editor-at-large at Gamma Sutra. Even though you may not have heard her name, you've probably read a good deal of her stuff, a lot of which has recently been a wave of positive GDC coverage that's borderline tearjerk. Gamma Sutra is owned by the same company that runs GDC, but it's important to note that the news she writes there is a good deal harder and more neutral than the more personal editorial pieces she writes for Kotaku, the latest of which explains how GDC was so wonderful that it brought her to tears. Meanwhile, there was an amusingly foreign New York Times piece floating around that echoed a lot of the same sentiment that the rest of us at GDC noticed. Indie games are a big deal now. Multi-billion dollar publishers are catering to them. Social issues are an even bigger deal. A whole lot of talks were about racial and sexual diversity, and how women need to be treated fairly. And in the midst of this New York Times article was a quote. A quote of a tweet that seemed to fully encapsulate everything I saw happening over the past week. I was really quite taken by this little snippet of charismatic rhetoric, so I'm gonna put it under a microscope. The good guys are finally winning, she says. That's her one sentence takeaway. Nothing more, nothing less. It is Twitter after all, so you've gotta be brief, but it's also a complicated statement, full of sweeping contextual references and an incisive personal opinion about all of them. Does it hold water against my own experiences? More importantly, does it stand up against research? I suppose it would make sense to start by trying to figure out just who these good guys are. It's easy to assume that she's talking about the stars of the show, the indie devs, making indie games in their indie studios with their indie standards and ideals. And I would argue that while calling them good guys might sound naive, it's a sentiment that can be backed up by their actions. After all, small game projects are usually safer investments in general. They're healthier for the industry and give the creators more room for creative expression. And this year's lineup of indies were chock full of creative expression. And it was the kind of expression that doesn't sacrifice interactivity or control. I mean, look at Gone Home. It's a combatless, story-driven, first-person exploration game that's actually a response to how non-interactive that genre typically is. Look at Cart Life. It's a bleak and personal autobiographical statement that has enough strategic decision-making systems running in the background to make Sid Meier jealous. By the end of the year, these projects may come to define what people expect out of indie art games, and they may no longer be stigmatized for chasing after movies and novels. People are expressing themselves not just with computerized simulations, but with meaty, interactive, and responsive game systems that don't have to rely on old tricks to get the jobs done. They don't have to be violent, tropey, or excessively macho. There's a good chance that the good guys she's referring to also includes traditionally disempowered groups of the game industry. After Cartlife steamrolled the IGF awards, its creator, Richard Hoffmeyer, promised to give the proceeds to charity and then swapped his IGF booth out for a browser-based text adventure that no one would have noticed otherwise. That would probably be an example of one of the good guys. And apparently, they're finally winning. But how long have they not been winning? What's final about them winning now? The Independent Game Festival was founded in 1998, with the first official awards lineup featuring games that seemed more geared to compete with mainstream titles, rather than tackle unconventional ideas and appeal to smaller niches. What exactly defines an independent game has generally been a bit murky, but the term and the IGF support group have been around since at least the late 90s, and nowadays it's become increasingly apparent that the ethos surrounding that term has turned into a style of its own. Note that even the non-Indie Developers' Choice Awards was dominated by games that look and feel like Indies. FTL was up there alongside Far Cry and Dishonored for some reason. Maybe because there was a lot of AAA experience between its team, but that's a game that sure as hell didn't have the support of a traditional publisher. It was actually made by Activision and Ubisoft employees who just couldn't get excited about blockbuster games anymore. 
and somehow going off to do their own thing with Kickstarter money meant that other game developers didn't consider them indies. Individual people like those are now making games as a personal medium for expression, and while this isn't a particularly new concept, what is new is its commercial viability. You can actually make money doing this stuff, maybe even by yourself. And you know, even if it fails, it doesn't have to be an expensive endeavor. UDK is free for personal use, and even then the commercial license is a flat $99 until you make $50,000 on your project. There's a free commercial version of Unity, XNA, and all sorts of more genre-specific stuff, but these tools didn't develop in a vacuum. The external influence that's driving their demand is high-speed internet. People download games nowadays, so small producers don't need factories to print discs and package them in boxes, and hosting a download server for them is pennies by comparison. They don't need to make it to retail. They don't even need to pay out for advertising. The fans in the media will promote their game for free. And that's why they're winning. What finally happened is that we're now seeing more people than ever before make a living off this stuff. People at large can finally make unconventional, risky indie games as a means of personal expression, and selling them to a small audience is actually profitable. Whether they're doing it to make a portfolio piece or make a statement, it's finally a legit job, and maybe even a career. Big publishers, especially Sony, are now striking deals with these guys to push their own platforms. While there is a good deal of cynicism to be gleaned from thinking that these fresh, innovative, and risky new ideas being ground back into the machine they're escaping from, it's a far more empowering position than them self-distributing $5 download links by themselves. It's democratization. More people can make what they want, how they want, and then make money off of it. There's room for everybody, and that's the way it should be. That's who the good guys are, and that's why they're finally winning. So even after scrutiny and a couple weeks of retrospective thought, I'm still kind of sort of feeling the optimism that she was celebrating immediately after the show. GDC was great. It really reinvigorated my faith in video games and gave me a lot to look forward to. However, I couldn't get access to conferences and see almost half the stuff that probably went into this tweet. Though GDC's prices certainly don't make it financially inclusive, it's clear that a whole lot of people want at least that facet to change. Lost Levels brought the conference outside of the halls and gave a slice of it to the rest of us for free. Big publishers were occupying spaces full of big couches and expensive drinks. They wanted to talk business with people, not demo high-tech showpieces in front of a crowd. The IGF Pavilion and GDC Play spaces felt like a far more comfy home than the rest of the facility, and these areas were so full of talent that I could have spent days in there and not covered it all. But what's sad is that I'll probably never see some of the most important discussions that went on during the conference. Stuff like the women in games or the number one reason why panels, or the developer rants or the spec ops writer talking about violence. This is the stuff that I want to see the most, but it's not free information and may never actually be affordable. It would have cost me anywhere from $700 to $1,000 to see it live, and just watching archival videos online is $500. That's one serious problem with GDC. The rest of it was a whole bunch of idealism and optimism that may be unrealistic, especially considering that we're on the verge of a new AAA game generation and all the tech fetishizing news that that brings, but for now, it feels really quite nice. Call of Duty shares shelf space with Kentucky Route Zero and Cart Life. The press that wrote about Dante's Inferno is now writing about Little Inferno. Hotline Miami and FTL are nominated for Game Developers Choice Awards, which, by the way, is hosted by Tim Schafer. Psst, uh, Show organizers, he's indie now. You might want to get a new host. We're not counterculture anymore. We are culture. So anyways, it's true. And I think that's a good thing. We're culture, guys. <laughs>